Right, back when I was in year seven, year seven is the start of secondary school, so I was 11 years old, I used to get beaten up a lot by year nines. They were two years older than me. They were about 14, 15. I used to go into school every day, go into the bag room, put my bag in there, and they'd close the door, and they'd make sure they'd hit me consistently on the stomach and the thighs and the arms. And it was a very painful time, and I feared a lot going into school. But then one day, as the normal routine happened, I ran in the bag room, put my bag down. They were about to beat me up, and some year, other year, and I went, Oi! Leave Shane alone. He's safe, isn't it? And that means I'm cool, I'm all right. And from that day on, these year nines left me alone. The reason why, because this boy that stopped them from beating me up was the hardest guy, one of the hardest guys in the school. And I had his protection, his comfort, and his love. And because of that, I respected him, I was in awe of him, and I even feared him. And I wanted to be like him. So I copied his walk, and I did everything. It's because this guy saved me from being bullied, which was a painful time in my life. Now, I remember when I was a young boy, and the first time I was hurt by someone. I was about four years old, and they walked out and left. And I felt loneliness, fear and scared. That's how I felt. And I realized that another human being could harm me in that way emotionally. And from that day on, even into my Christian life today, I've been fearing others for what they can do to me emotionally and physically. And I've had my guard up. But today, I want to see what Jesus says in his Bible about all the things I've just mentioned. But well, first of all, we're going to pray to ask the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts so we can understand his word more. So let's pray together. Our oh Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and kind kindness towards us every day. We thank you, Lord, that you've brought us here today and that we can worship you freely in a country that does not persecute us. And I pray, Lord, that you open up each and every one of our hearts today, Lord, so we can understand you and understand your word. Forgive us our sins, Lord, and help us to forgive anyone that has sinned against us if we're holding anything against anyone today. And help us, Lord, to worship you as a community and individuals on this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're in Luke 12, verses 4 to 7. And I want you to picture the scene for a minute. Jesus is chatting to his disciples, and he's talking to them about a lot of stuff. He's talking to them about worry. He's talking to him about money. He's talking to him about what will happen to them in the future. And he's also saying to them, look, everything that you say in private will be shouted from the rooftops. And he's saying all these things to them in a conversation with them. And we're going to pick up part of this conversation and look at what Jesus is saying to him at this part of this conversation. And it starts at verse 4. So that's Luke 12, verse 4. And Jesus says this to them. He's just said to them that everything you say in private is going to be shouted from the rooftops one day. He's just said that to them. And he says this. I tell you, my friends, do not be, what's that word say? Afraid, Afraid of those who kill the body and after can do no more. Jesus is saying this to his disciples because he knows they have a tendency to fear others and the harm they can do to them. Jesus has said this to him because the tendency of the disciples is to fear other people and the harm that can happen to them. And I think we're like these disciples today. We can fear others for the harm they can do to us. And this week I did a little test, a little survey in some people in the church and outside the church going, do you fear other people? And especially the men are like, nah, of course I don't. I don't fear no one like that. But I'm going to show you how each and every one of us fear the harm that others can do to us, just like the disciples. So check it out. Have you ever been in this situation when you've been on a bus or a train and it's very packed and there's someone behind you is talking about Jesus? They're talking about Jesus and they're cussing him. They're cussing him and his church. And they're saying all these stupid facts that are not facts at all about how Jesus didn't exist and how the Bible is made up. I've been in this situation, and I wonder if you have too, on a bus or a train. I guarantee 95% of the time, 
we don't turn around and talk to them and correct them. Because we're in the middle of a busy train or a busy bus, and we're scared what them and others can do to us. We're scared that they can humiliate us. We're scared to stick up for Jesus. Or have you ever been in this situation? Just ignore that voice up there. Have you ever been in this situation? Is that, um, sorry, I've been put off now. Have you ever been in this situation where you've been in your social group with a group of friends, either down the pub or just round a mate's house, and many of them are non-Christians? And it comes to, what have you been doing this weekend? And people are saying, yeah, I went to the pub. Yeah, I went and got drunk. I went around my girlfriend's house. I saw a couple of friends. And it comes to you, and they go, what did you do this weekend? And you go, uh, I sat at home reading a book with my mum. Uh, yeah, that's what I did this weekend. When actually you've been worshipping the living God in the community of believers. And the reason why you didn't say that to this person at this moment in time, because you feared the people around you being ridiculed, humiliated, and embarrassed. So that shows us we are like the disciples. We do fear others for the harm they can do to us. And check this situation as well. Have you ever just gone out, just before you go out and tell someone about Jesus, that fear in the bottom of your stomach, thinking, oh my days, I'm going to go and tell people about Jesus and look like a white idiot on the road. Have you ever felt that? That's fear of others and the harm others can do to you. I get that just before I go door knocking. I think to myself, I cannot do this. I'm fearing those people rejecting me and harming me in some way. And that shows that I fear others. And I reckon all of us here fear others as well. So I want to give us a little thing we can do over the next couple of weeks. It's Easter in two weeks, as you well know. And we've got a great opportunity to knock on our neighbour's doors and give them the gospel and invite them to church. Now, I'm standing up here and I've got to do this as well. And I want each and every one of us, if you can, to knock on someone's door this week or next week and invite them to church. And it can't be someone you know either. Someone you don't know, knock on their door and invite them to church. That's a challenge I'm going to set for all of us here today. And before you do that, I guarantee you're going to be fearing those people for the harm they can do to you by rejecting you or humiliating you. So as you can see, we are like the disciples. Jesus has said to his disciples, do not fear others for the harm they can do to you. And we are like them. And I'm going to show you as well, we don't just fear others outside the church, we also fear one another, which is wrong because we should love and cherish one another. I want you to put it like this, right? Say if I took your memory, got a machine, and put it in there and had all your thoughts this week and put it on the PowerPoint. All the thoughts that you had in your head and all the things you'd done in private that only you and your family would know or maybe a close, close friend would, you kn- would know. And I decided to put it on the PowerPoint and show everyone in church. That would be a fearful thing, right? Because we've all had really bad thoughts about other people this week. And if I did that, you'd probably not turn up to church again. Or this. This is a bit more realistic. We all, many of us have spiritual journals and diaries. Say if I nicked your diary from your house, opened it up and said, instead of the sermon today, I'm going to say your private business to everyone. What you've been thinking over the last six months, what you truly think of others in the church, and what you truly think of others around you. So say if I read that out, that would be humiliating and embarrassing for you, and you'd probably be really angry at me as well and never forgive me, or you, or you would be really hard to forgive me. And that shows is that we fear what others can do to us. We fear humiliation. We fear retaliation. We fear rejection. So we are similar to the disciples here today, fearing man, what and the harm that they can do to us. And we need a medicine for this. We need some powerful medicine When I was 12 years old and I got sick, my mum used to give me some powerful medicine and it always didn't taste that nice. And Jesus is going to give us some powerful medicine today and it doesn't taste that nice, but it is nice and it's healthy. So let's carry on to see what Jesus says in verse 5. So he's just told us not to fear others for the harm they can do to us, but I will show you who you should fear. Verse 5. 
Fear him. That is God. After killing, after killing of the body has the what? Power to throw you into hell. Now Jesus is saying this is whom we should fear. We should fear God who has ultimate power, who is awesome and holy and created the heavens and the earth. And notice who is Jesus saying this to? His disciples. And he's mentioned hell. And 11 out of 12 of Jesus' disciples are in heaven. And he still says this to them. And he's saying the same to us today. Fear God for his awesome power because he can destroy you eternally. It's a bit like this. If we were standing in front of a judge because we committed some crime, say you were speeding, you didn't pay your taxes, you cheated on your benefits or you stole something from someone, we would fear that judge, would we not? Because that judge has power over us to take away our freedom, to take away our, from our loved ones, to take away our wages, to take away us from everything we love. And we would fear that judge. Now, if we fear a human judge like that after we do wrong, how much more should we fear the living God? Because it says in James, it is a fearful thought to be brought into the hands of the living God. Fearing God's a bit like this as well. We've all seen Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, right? I think many of us have, yeah? And on there, there's Aslan. Aslan. And everyone's going, Aslan's coming soon. Aslan's coming. He's going to save us. Aslan is coming. And you see this respect and awe that people have for Aslan. And during the movie, when you first watch it, you're like, who's Aslan? When's he coming? I can't wait to see this Aslan. And then Aslan returns, and he returns as a big, strong lion. And when his enemies, the Snow Queen, come to visit Aslan, they fear him and they're scared of him. But not only his enemies, Aslan's allies, his friends, also are in awe, a fear and respect Aslan. And when Aslan does his mighty roar, roar, all his enemies push back. And on the thing, you see all his allies look at him and all his friends look at him with awe, reverence and respect. Now that's how we should treat God. Even if you are a Christian here today, we should treat God with that awe, respect and reverence because he has the power to destroy us eternally. And that's in hell. And hell is a place where there's no good thing. It's a place where God is continually pouring out his anger on sinners and all the pain, all the emotions, emotional, physical, uh, emotional, physical, mental pain you've experienced in this life will be much worse in hell and there's no goodness. And that's the power that God has over humanity. And we should fear that God with all reverence and respect. In the second part of the catechism, there's always a question that gets me. It says this, do you worship God as the holiest being ever? And I have to say to myself, I've done the second part of the catechism a few times, and every time I come to it, I'm so ashamed because I have to say, no, I treat him as any next man on road, any next person I walk next to. And that shows is that I don't fear God, and the reason why I know that is because I don't obey him properly in my lives. And I think we're all in that situation, how we don't fear God because we don't obey him properly in our lives. And I will show you how even more now. In our culture, we have a problem with authority. We all do. We have a problem with authority. We don't like authority figures. Now, many of you have had bosses or are going to have bosses, yeah? And I guarantee, if you're working as well, you've obeyed those bosses in some way. It's because you ain't lost your job or you left your job out of mutual consent. So you've obeyed those bosses. But check deep in your heart, why have you obeyed that boss? I was reading Colossians the other day and it says you obey your bosses not as people pleasers but as pleasing the Lord. Even behind their backs, obey them. I guarantee we obey our bosses because they pay us money. Our boss has the power over us to make us destitute, take away our wages from us, and to take away our comfort. And that's why we fear our boss. We don't fear our boss because God has told us to fear our boss. And how I know that is because we talk about our bosses behind our backs, behind their backs. And that shows we don't truly fear God. Instead, we fear our boss who can harm us financially. So whom do we fear? God or men? And another one, accountability software. 
Accountability software can be a way of fearing God. I'm not denying that, yeah? And accountability software is this. It stops you from watching really bad stuff on the internet. Really bad stuff. Violent, sexual, whatever. It stops you from doing it. And it can be a way that you're fearing God. But I checked my heart the other day when I was going through this sermon and I was thinking and I was praying, where don't I fear you, Lord? And I realized I don't fear God in this area. It's because I thought to myself, my, when you go on a bad website, your accountability software emails someone else in the church. So that someone else in the church will know I've gone on that bad website. And I thought, I fear that more. I fear that email going out to my pastor rather than fearing God who knows that I get tempted to watch that at times. And even that weren't there, I might do it. Why? Because I fear my pastor more than I fear God. And maybe some of you have accountability software today. And I would say, check your hearts. Whom are you fearing? Are you fearing that it will come to me? Or are you fearing God? Because I can't do much harm to you. I'll give you a slap. That's it. God has the power to throw you into eternal hell. So whom are we fearing today? Now, Jesus has just given us a call. And he said, do not fear man who can harm you only in this life, but fear God who has the power to destroy you eternally. But now Jesus is going to give his disciples something else. And he's going to give us something else here today. So he's given us the call, and now he's going to give us something else. Verse 6. We all there? Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Are they not sold for two pennies? That's really cheap, by the way. These birds are the cheapest in the market you could buy in this time. So they're worth literally nothing. Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. To put this in today's life, Jesus is basically saying this. You know those dusty, dirty pigeons at Trafalgar Square? Those flying rats that carry around disease and we all hate those dusty, dirty pigeons that fly around. God cares for them because he values them. And we do not value them. We take little value of them. But God cares for them, he nurtures them, and he feeds them because he values those dirty, dusty pigeons. And if he values them, how much more New Life Church does God value you, you of little faith? So why fear others and the harm others can do to you? It's similar to this, right? We've all had people love us in our lives. We've all had people care for us. A lot of us have life stories where we think, no, I cared for myself. Yeah, man, from the age of one, I was feeding myself milk. No, you weren't. Someone fed you milk. Someone clothed you. Someone looked after you. Someone even comforted you in your dark times for at least for the first six to ten years of your life whether that's carer or parents. Over the last few weeks, I've been writing out my life story because I have massive victim mentality in this area. And I've realised how many people cared for me. My mother fed me, clothed me, cared for me all my life, even when I rebelled against her. And even to this day, she rings me up saying, are you sure, saying you've got enough money? Are you sure you're all right? She still cares for me and loves me because she puts great value on me. Now, the Bible says all human beings are sinners. And we all look out for ourselves in some certain way. So if our parents, parents and my mother who are sinners can do that, how much more will God look after us? the most awesome and holiest being ever. How much more will God look after us so it doesn't matter what other people do to harm us? Because if you're trusting and believing in Jesus here today, God loves you and cares for you. And that picture of your parents or carers bringing you up, God's a billion times more caring and comforting than that. So we don't need to fear one another and we don't need to fear people outside and we can live and obey Jesus, we do not need to be afraid. But we all tend to be afraid of others because of the harm they can do to us instead of fearing God who has the power to throw us into hell to save us or to comfort us. Now all throughout the Bible you see this idea of fearing man and fearing God and God's people have gone both ways. 
You see in the first couple of chapters of Exodus, Pharaoh says, destroy those Hebrew babies because they're growing too much. And the Hebrew midwives go, no, we're going to fear God and obey God and not kill life instead of fearing Pharaoh. And we see just before the Israelites are about to hit the promised land in Deuteronomy, they're about to go in and they send spies and the spies come back going, don't go in there, there's loads of people and they're about this big, this big, and oh mate, I can't go in there. And God is saying, I'm going to be with you, don't fear them, they might be big but I'll slap them. And the Israelites go, no, we can't. They feared man and what man could do to him instead of fearing God who was with them. And we see it with David and Goliath as well. The whole Israelite army is trembling with fear when they look at Goliath, this eight foot tall man with a massive spear and a shield and a fat helmet. And David comes along who says, I trust and love the Lord and fear him more than this brute and destroys him. David feared God, but the Israelite army feared man. And we see this throughout the picture of the kings as well. Ahab, He was married to Jezebel. And all through, what you see of Ahab is that he's scared of his wife. Everything his wife says to do, he does. He worships other gods. He robs people. He murders Naboth. All because his wife tells him to do that and winds him up to do that. Ahab was scared of others rather than being and fearing God and obeying him. And then we come to Jesus and we still see God's people fearing other people. We see Nicodemus coming at night instead of the daytime because he feared what others would think of him, the religious leaders. We see that people were fearing to be kicked out of the synagogue because they didn't, so they didn't confess Jesus because they feared man and what they could do and the harm they could do to them. And we see it with the disciples. As soon as Jesus gets nicked, they're off and even one of them run naked in the field. They feared people instead of fearing God. And we are all like that today. We fear others and the harm others can do to us instead of fearing this mighty and powerful God. But I tell you one person who didn't fear man, and that was Jesus Christ. He had all sorts done to him. His family rejected him. His mates dusted. People fell away. People didn't listen to him. People grasped him up to the religious leaders. People smacked him, spat at him and cursed him. And he did not fear others, even though they harmed him greatly by eventually taking his life and killing him. And he died a brutal death on the cross. And he died for a brutal death on the cross and rose again three days later to put whoever will believe in him in a right relationship with God. And he died for us, fearing others. Jesus took that horrendous sin of us fearing each other and people outside of the church more than God. Jesus took that on the cross. Hallelujah. So we do not, when we come to judgment day, have to fear God throwing us into hell if we trust in Jesus Christ. But we still need to respect and be of awe in him. It says in the Bible as well, we are a new creation. We have been given a new heart when we're in Jesus and we can battle sin in our lives. And one thing I've seen in my life, I fear so many people instead of fearing my creator. And I think all of us are like that and we can all change because we have the Holy Spirit in us if you believe in Jesus and we can start fearing and delighting in God's fear. It says to delight in God's fear in the Bible. Delighting in that instead of fearing what others can do to us, embarrass us, humiliate us or slap us. We can fear that God this week. And a couple of ways we can do this, I've just given you this week, is one, evangelism. It's Easter soon. What a great way to go out and do evangelism, no? I've had to gear myself up for this evangelism. I don't like, like, I get a bit all like, I can't let them see me like this, talking about Jesus. It might harm my respect. How about door knocking in the next couple of weeks or talking to people on the street, giving people leaflets, inviting them to an Easter service? In our culture, we still have an idea of going to church at Easter. Let's get out there and tell people about Jesus to come to church on Easter Sunday so they can hear the gospel and by God's grace, he will put the fear of him in them and they will turn to Jesus. How about doing that this week? Knocking on someone's door, going up to someone in the street, telling them about Jesus, the shopkeeper, the bus man, your next door neighbour, housemates, anyone. 
That's one way we can live this out this week, to get over the fear of man and fear God. Another way we can live this out this week is by praying. I mean, we, men always forget to pray, and we do. Praying, praying that we would fear God more than fearing others and that God will change our heart so we can delight in fearing him and asking God to forgive us for not fearing him but fearing others. And another way we can lift us out this week is being more open with one another. A lot of us have heinous sins in our lives because we're human beings and God sees them. If you've been struggling with sin for years, especially heinous sins, God sees them. So why not be open with others? Where it is appropriate, of course. But why not be fully open and not lie about your sin because God has already seen it? And another way we can live this out this week is by literally meditating on this verse. Luke 12, verses 4 to 7. I've got to tell you, this week I have been blessed by studying this text. I've seen all this sin in my life. I've seen all this fear of what people can do to me. You guys and outside, everyone from my mother to my pastor to the congregation to the shopkeeper, allow that fear. And when I say allow, I mean stop that fear. Let me fear God so I can love people and lay down my life for them and obey him no matter what happens to me in this life. And God has really put this on my heart to fear him. And I pray that you meditate on this verse so you can fear him too. Because I know all of us in our lives fear one another and fear people outside instead of fearing God as we should. Now, I think it would be good if we all come for a minute and respond to this. I'm going to close my eyes and I'd like you to join me. And I'm going to ask God to help me to fear him more this week instead of fearing what others can do to me and how others can harm me. I'm going to pray and ask God to help me to do that this week. And I'm going to repent from fearing man and ask God to help me to delight in fearing him. And I'm also going to ask God to help me to love people because the way that you can love people more and more is by fearing God and his power. So if you would like to all join me now in that one minute response and think of ways that you can live this out this week personally, whether it's through evangelism, prayer, read the Bible, opening up more about your sin, wherever it is, I pray that you come now and respond and then I'll finish us off in a prayer. I'll make sure it is a minute this time because I know sometimes I can do a 30 second job. It's going to be a minute, right? Oh, Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you, Lord, is that you've put in our hearts today to fear you who has ultimate power to destroy us, comfort us and save us instead of fearing what others can do. But help us with this fear to obey you, to love our neighbour more than we love ourselves, to destroy and drive out sin. Help us to honour you and to love you, Lord Jesus, and help us to have a heart for you this week and help this not be a sermon where we just listen to it on a Sunday and just don't do anything but Lord help this to be a sermon where we live it out in our lives of fearing you and delighting in your fear I pray work in our hearts because we cannot do it by ourselves don't let it be fake Lord in Jesus name Amen